Have you ever experienced a dream in which you were both the observer and the actor? Of course you have. When you think about it, I suppose that condition is not so much different from waking life. For there, too, do we not stand apart and scrutinize our own actions, analyze our deeper motives? And yet there is a difference. I cannot explain it, and I doubt that Freud or Jung could explain it either. But let me tell you that as I awoke from a dream, the content of which I can no longer remember, I became aware that I was the dream analogue to the waking self who had dreamed. In short, I was the dream of myself. For all I know, all my predecessors in this role experienced the same moment of realisation as the dreamer awoke. I should enjoy meeting one or more of them so we might compare experiences. I doubt that the soul of the dreamer is diminished by these incidents. Rather, I imagine it is more in the nature of cell division, whereby new cells are cast off to survive on their own. And there is a place where they survive, if they do. It is a great dream city which its inhabitants call Vastarian, though none of them remember having given it that, or any name. Let me tell you what I remember of that place. It is composed of the nightmare landscapes and ghettos conjured up by the sleeping minds of all men. Or perhaps there is such a city for every dreamer, and the inhabitants thereof are the collection of dream selves that particular dreamer has nightly begotten. Yes, I suspect that is the case, for the look of it held for me, upon my arrival, a strange sense of familiarity. It is a junkyard of a place. Collapsing buildings, some antique, some repellently modernistic, and others altogether alien in design, choke the littered streets and seem to compete for space like fat men on a narrow bus stop bench. The skies above are a perpetual grey void, and there is often a mist which seems half a rarefied cloud of lingering pollution. There is no cemetery for it is in its entirety a cemetery in its own right. There is nothing, no trade or occupation with which to busy oneself. Yet the streets are constantly trodden underfoot by aimlessly drifting mobs, not one member of which ever turns to wish another a good day or good luck, for these are unheard of there. There are cinemas in which no film is ever shown, only flickering lights, for everyone seeks refuge there for other activities they do not want anyone else to see, though all do them. There are no restaurants, no food stores, and I cannot remember eating there. Hunger there is a plenty. But in Vastarian one learns that hunger is to be maintained unabated, for yearning is the true satisfaction. An empty cup is the only fullness. We practice an epicureanism of asceticism. The dream city is an incarnation of entropy, as are all places, if truth be told, but the dwellers in Vastarian acknowledge the fact and rejoice in it, in their own grim way. One senses that the whole place is a vast womb, all its inhabitants desiring to be dreamt again to dwell inside the head of the one who begat them. But they soon forget, for the frustration itself becomes a cherished sustenance. It is only through discomfort and anxiety and despair that one finally becomes self-aware, aware that one is no real self, but merely an echo of one. The rule is that one comes to transcend the torment of despondency and longing by submitting to them coming to enjoy the taste of them, and thenceforward to live on a diet of fading pangs. But this I could not do. Cursed by this dissatisfaction with dissatisfaction, I alone sought a way out. I remembered, or thought I did, that there was somewhere a world of waking reality, 
though I could not be absolutely sure that this seeming recollection was not merely another dream. But that possibility I excluded. So I sought some clue as to any path one might take to find a world more real than this one of Bastarian. I ventured to violate the unspoken code of unspeaking silence. I began to stop people in the streets, their faces indistinct in the never-ending twilight mist, and to inquire what they remembered of the world from which we had come. Was there a path back there? All alike appeared distinctly uncomfortable at being accosted. To a man they averred total ignorance even as to what I might mean. I had the fleeting impression once or twice that someone knew all too well of a realer world than ours, but dared not tell me. Understand, if you will, that I too savoured the baleful glory of Bastarian, a place of ontological tenuousness, of a precious shoddiness everywhere threatening to erode and to collapse into dust. I, too, paused to gaze upon the inert piles of chipped and sooty bricks that implied a defunct chimney when it still stood, still a few feet erect into the vague sky. My eye followed the remaining beams, ribs of buildings long gone, for one's eye was thus led along into an absent past, to a ghostly memory of a building that must have risen anciently as a proud colossus. With this vision of the past, one could savour the more bittersweetly the structure's present state of ruination. Every shell of a building chanted the holiness of desolation. And Vastarian was all desolation. But it was only a shadow of obliteration. I must have the real thing. Others sought in vain to persuade me that in the nature of the case, the nullity I sought must perforce take the shape of a dream, a trace, a cinder. A real world would be raw and bleeding. I protested that a vision of ruination, however bracing, could not match that which was true and waking, hard and unyielding, unremittingly grounded. They kindly warned me not to go that way but I replied that the unreal unreal was not good enough. There had to be a real unreal, and I must find it. To savour the merely hypothetical could never deliver the soul from its suspicions that it was fundamentally a falsehood. My opponents tried to divert me from this heresy, pointing out that a real unreal must be a sham and a hoax. In the end they would have driven me out but there was no other place for me to go, or so they thought. At last, as if in response to the prayer of my yearning, a bookstore window peeped out along a street of closed and locked stores where it had not been yesterday, and I knew I must enter at once. Who knew if some crumbling page might yield the secret I sought? And if not, disappointment was another delicacy I had learned to savour. And yet, one can become sated with just about anything. No proprietor was in evidence, only a caged bird. It was plainly a crow, but it repeated learned phrases like a parrot, until it seemed to see me pick up one book at random, an old and faded paperback edition. A paper-bound book held many natural advantages over a finer, hard-bound book even if the latter were bound in faded cloth. A paperback was cheap and shoddy to begin with, by design, and entropy had much to work with. Spines would be bent into broken circles. Pages would have sloughed off their cheap glue to fall like autumn leaves onto forgotten floors and between articles of furniture, forever missing. Such was the volume I had chosen, not for its title, but for its condition, for I felt that, in such a condition, it actually embodied that grey truth I sought in its pages. And then the crow spoke to me its own words, not those copied pointlessly from another. Have you encountered a book that is not an instance of that which it relates, but which talks about a further reality, far removed from itself? That is the book you hold. 
Take it. There is no one to pay. Not with money, anyway. I had the book that told the way past space-hung screens that keep lost dimensions to their own domains. Casting furtive glances over my shoulder, I half ran back to my dingy quarters and threw myself on the bed, the only article of furniture in the place, and opened the coveted volume. The title, I now saw, was The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, by one Thomas Ligotti, a name I had once heard in the most dreadful of connections. A name I had once heard in the most dreadful of connections. I tried to calm my pulsing anticipation, and I began to read. It was a challenging treatise that moved ineluctably to the conclusion that the human species had taken a fatal misstep in its evolution, the result being that our kind was cursed with the terrible burden of too much intelligence, too large a brain for its own good. This is why mankind alone made its life a gauntlet of worries, a series of troubling and unanswerable questions. This is why philosophers and religious believers had tormented themselves with conundrums that had nothing to do with reality outside their mad brains, but arose only within them. Thus did they rack themselves with guilt for failing to meet the self-issued demands of fictive moral codes bequeathed them by their benighted ancestors. The animals were wiser than man because they were free of these painful delusions. And meantime, human beings lived as a pestilence upon the earth, infesting it like termites until its resources were exhausted, its continents depopulated from sexual plagues. Some had the wisdom to abort their offspring rather than sadistically allow them to be born into such a gallery of horrors. But this author proclaimed not the death of God, but the extermination, the abortion of all mankind. It would only be a gain both in the long run and in the short run. As I devoured the pages, slowly, not wishing to cheat myself of any savoury morsel, I found myself utterly absorbed, oblivious of anything around me. And when at last I looked up from the book, though still stretched out on a bed, I knew at once that I was no longer in the dream city of Vastarian. Sliding off the thin mattress, I hastened to the window and gazed forth. It was the world I had sought, the land of ontological worth, of waking reality. I had done it, or rather the book had done it. Before me there stretched an endless vista of sublime desolation such as I had never imagined. All was wreckage, as far as the eye could see. Clearly some universal holocaust had visited the earth. To all appearances no one could have escaped, at least as far as the damage extended, and in that moment I resolved to set forth to tour the smoking pit of this world this ubiquitous monument of ruination. I seemed to myself to be inhabiting a, a fleshly body, but so I had when in Vestarian. The test would come when I knew whether I could feel hunger, thirst, or fatigue. If I did, there was no apparent chance of satisfying these needs, so I should succumb without regret. Ligotti's pages had convinced me that it should be my various duty in any case. But in the meantime, I had to crisscross as much of the forlorn landscape as I could, rejoicing in the smashing of all things. For only in the desuetude could their true beauty come to fruition, only in death could they come to true birth. And I felt like a proud father looking over a maternity ward. In my pilgrimage I heard no chirping bird, saw no scampering animal. All had returned to the primordial stillness that had blanketed the primitive earth billions of years ago. The many centuries of pestilential corruption had at last been purified. On the fifth day of my journey, after a peaceful sleep in the shelter of a rubble heap, I was alarmed at the sound of human voices ahead. 
It was like hearing a fire engine in the middle of the night. And it was a fire I meant to put out. I had found a rifle and a pistol in the ruins of a store a couple of days before, and I scrounged around till I found the matching ammunition. Over a hill I saw them sitting around a campfire. They were singing hymns, seeking to fortify one another's spirits amid the carnage surrounding them. How they had escaped the descending axe I could not guess, though there must have been ways. After all, I did not know the nature of what had befallen the world. The small band caught sight of me and rose, approaching me with welcoming arms outstretched. They made themselves into simple targets, and I killed them all. Their bullet-riddled corpses displayed the fossils of shock and disbelief. But it was their own fault for having lived, was it not? There might be more vermin that had survived extermination, but I should deal with them as I found them. For now I rejoiced with great and solemn joy. Here was the reality for which I had thirsted, like a heart panting for the woodland stream. Here was all-embracing dissolution, a universe of crushed debris. And it was no dream. It was reality. The gods of entropy be praised! Are you stupid enough to ask yourself why I would compose such an account? when no one still lives to read it? The truth is simple, and it is this. The book you are holding is not a description of some reality at a distance. Of course not. It is entirely self-referential, a world unto itself. It is not about something. It is that thing. 